Here's our entire interview with the great Paul Carrick. I'm John Bowden from Rocky Street Book. Here's a guy who's worked with so many people, most recently, of course, with Eric Clapton. We know about his solo career, Don't Shed a Tear. Wow. He was with Squeeze, with Madness, Mike and the Mechanics, whole bunch of people. He talks about all of that in this full interview with Paul Carrick. Enjoy. Love the new single. Great, like fantastic song. I don't know how... You know, I, I talk to a lot of artists and, and sometimes people will go, well, you know, I just kind of worked on like McCartney will do this. Oh, it's a good little tune. But I, artists sometimes have this. Well, it's just a little old me because it is you. I mean, you look in the mirror, it's still the same face you see every day. But I mean, in order for you to have gotten in all those rooms and man, I've been playing you on the radio for years. I've been in radio 38 years. Do you stop sometimes and wonder like what the heck kind of journey has this been? Yeah, sometimes. Not too often because I just keep going forward to try to anyway but uh, if i stop and think about it it's amazing we're you know come a long way from uh, a, a little kid in sheffield with no nothing going you know i mean i'm i'm a self taught musician I, I didn't know anybody started very humble beginnings and it, it is amazing actually i often feel like i'm really i'm name dropping you know it's like oh yeah well when I did this thing with Roger Waters, it's like, oh, you did that. And then, it, you know, it, but it's not. But uh, no, it's incredible. And I'm so grateful to have uh, had a career. You're, let's just say you're in the dentist's office and there's someone next to you and say, uh, so what do you do? How do you answer? What do you say? I know. Funnily enough, you just reminded me of, I mean, it's a few years ago now, but I remember <laughs> it's when I had hair, actually. I was in the uh, barbers getting a haircut and the guy said that, you know, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm, you know, musician, singer. And as I was sitting there, Tempted came on the radio, you know, this, this which I sang with Squeeze. I said, actually, that's me there. And he said, yeah, right. He said, that's Paul Weller. <laughs> so... Uh, Right, no, country, I, wrong I, I left it there. <laughs> you know. Really? You didn't, you know, when well, they say radio announcers were the bottom feeders of entertainment and we we're like name drop, like crazy bass. And uh, I'm always curious about that. And people keep asking me that all the, and, and it's interesting on our channel, you know, we've done quite well on YouTube on our channel. That's a question that a lot of fans just rise up to the old, well, don't they realize they did the work? That's why they got in the room. Like I said, a while ago, but they always go, I'd be walking in. Hi, John Bowden. Tempted. <laughs> you know, how long? How's it going? No, it, well, it's funny because that, going back to what you were originally saying, because um, when people do ask, it's very weird because there are people who know loads about you and know a lot about, and, and there are other people who know absolutely nothing. Until you say, you know, how long living is, Oh, really? Oh, that's you. All oh, right. Okay. So it, it, it's, it's strange. And even, even when I do an interview with uh, somebody who might know a, a little bit, but they still, uh, I still kind of have to explain who I am, which is very weird, but it's not a problem really. I mean, as I say, comes back to, first of all, absolutely delighted to have made a living from music fed my kids. They're all grown up. They're all good. And still here, still doing it, still healthy. So I'm one of the lucky ones, to be honest. So that's the way I look at it. The new track, you know, when I first listened to it, I remember thinking like, just, he just keeps putting these things out. Like what the, what was the, what's the process like for you writing and tell me about the new song. It's going down quite well. Even a couple of people who, who I know who, know about music and the I'm thinking but it's kind of bog standard isn't it it's like no it's great man and I think it it's that borderline thing of you know between cliche and just a simple sentiment a simple statement that connects you know it's a good vocal helps to get through you know helps to carry a a simple sentiment um it's kind of true. You know, I wrote it thinking about somebody uh, who was, you know, struggling a little bit. And um, we've all been locked down, which has made everything a bit sensitive. So um, 
No, I'm really pleased, actually. I mean, as I say, it it's not uh, re- reinventing the wheel. It's a, it's a simple thing. You think, well, I've heard those chords before and all that, but hopefully, well, if it connects, that's fantastic. That's that's all I can do because I'm not a I'm not a reader, you know. So I I I don't have a too many angles on stuff. I, I gotta kind of write simple stuff from the heart. I'm no intellectual, so. Um, if I can do that thing of a simple sentiment that connects and that's great. With you, you're, you came from a working family. You're, I know your mother wanted you to, 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 to not be a musician because I mean, listen, it, things got to get done. What was it like? What, what growing up? Well, growing, uh, losing, losing your dad. I mean, oh, I, I, well, no, no. what's it's the connection? Devast- Where do you get the strength? No, it was, it was devastating, you know, cause he was a great guy. He was very much loved by us and, my mum's family, particularly, who were very close uh, knit family, and they they loved him to bits. So he was a great guy, and he was the kind of musical. He is a music lover, and kind of encouraged that side. His family had the genes, you know, and um, although and he played a little bit, he dabbled. In fact, that's a great story, but it's too long to tell you about how he met my mum. And um, you can tell it. I don't mind. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, so my mom was um, engaged to be married. She was married to a guy who was in, in the Second World War in the Far East. And um, he came back a broken man. He was, you know, and it turns out he couldn't go through with it. And and uh, my mom's lot, they were pretty poor and everything, but they booked a room somewhere to have a reception and they booked the thing. So they said, well, we've got the sandwiches, you know. We've got a couple of crates of beer. We're gonna. We might as well go and have them. And um, my mom worked with this guy who was my dad's brother. And he said, "Oh, can I bring? Can I bring our kid along? You know, he he plays a little bit of drums, and Fred plays the piano. And um, that's how they met. And and then they got <laughs> they, they got married. <laughs> Not on that day, but you know, wow. it's a mind boggler. Yeah." There must have been times with all these people you've worked with. I mean, Clapton comes to mind um, that you were starstruck. But were you ever starstruck through the years? Yeah, I mean, I was. It's, that again, it's funny you should say that because I was watching uh, last night on TV the Ron Howard Beatles documentary, and I actually did that at one of the Ringo All Star tours. And I don't think I ever got used. To, <laughs> I don't think I ever felt, you know, worthy. <laughs> <laughs> to be in the band because uh, that it was Ringo, you know, and I, I I saw the Beatles a couple of times, and they had a major effect on me, you know, musically because that thing about losing my dad when you know I was eleven, I was already messing around on the bit of drum kit that was in the uh, attic, you know, it was what well, you couldn't really call it a drum kit, it was bits and pieces, but I was already st- struck by music, you know, and and when the whole Beatles and the whole Liverpool thing happened, it, I think it saved my life. You know, it just, it was just music. It was just something there, you know. How far back do you guys go? Well, we not we never, we never were close or anything. I, I, I mean, he got me to play on a couple of his albums. I played on uh, Pilgrim. I can't remember the name of the other one, actually. Oh, what I played on a couple of his albums at, at all you know, bumped into him when we'd done a few charity things. Gary Brooker from Procol Harum used to put on a lot of these charity things and get people together. So I was often in the house band or something like that. Um, he was always great. But, and um, then he eventually, I think somebody dropped out for some reason uh, on a, on this tour about, this be six or seven years ago, and he called me up and he always does, makes his own calls, you know, which is great. It's not his people. He calls yeah. you up and he's, he asked me if I fancy going out on tour. I just, ah, yeah, I did. But even even with somebody like Eric, it took a little while to feel comfortable in the thing because I've played with some guys in in those setups, you know, amazing musicians, you know, Steve Gadd, Steve Jordan, Nathan, um, Willie Weeks. These, my kind of heroes, you know, players, and, and I and I always thought, oh, yeah, I'm not worthy, you know. But uh, to and but to be kind of accepted and respected has done myself esteem no harm yeah. at all. 
Did, did your mother see? I mean, I, and I don't know. Uh, uh, is is your mother still around? Did she see? No, 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 she's not. No, no. But did no. she see some of your success? Yes, she did. She did, and uh, I gather she was quite proud. But um, my mom, she had a tough life. You know, she was a, uh, a a working class girl. You know, they were very poor. Um, the six kids that my grandfather died at thirty. In his early thirties, left my grandmother with six kids. You know. They were all had to work from being 14, 15 years old, you know. Um, and then, you know, she had the devastation of, of losing my dad. And um, she had to bring up my brother and myself. My brother was four, uh, 15, I was 11. And my brother grew up, he, he immediately took on, because we lived in a shop. We lived at the back of a shop in the one room, outside toilet, two beds. And my dad was a painter and decorator, you know, and my mom ran the shop selling paint and wallpaper. And um, she worked at, and, and then she had to bring up two boys. And so that was tough. And she, you know, my brother's fantastic. He, he grew up overnight and took on this role. Whereas I was just this stupid kid who, as long as I went to school, they took their eye off the ball with me a little bit. You know what I mean? So by the time I left school, I was playing in bands and I was off. And uh, she was rightly concerned <laughs> that this wasn't going to be good. You know, because it wasn't a respectable career that it is now. You know, this was, this was uh, sleeping rough and you know, all that stuff and all that went with it. When Ace and How Long, I mean, I know that's your song and you sang it, but when, when, with, uh, what, what did that feel like? I mean, it's yours, you created it, uh, you know, the band, it was a great time in music. Um, um, I love the seventies, love the mid seventies, but how did it feel for you? I mean, how did your friends and family react to that? That yeah, was pretty exciting. I mean, uh, like I say, I'd been from leaving school at 15, I had, been living hand to mouth um we've we had this little band aced playing for in pubs for beer money we, we made a record somehow and um it had this big old hit i mean it was exhilarating and it brought us to the states and all that but then it got a bit scary because you know we were suddenly our first tour of the states was opening up for yes in the wow in the arenas, you know, and we were this dodgy little bar band, you know, in our scruffy t-shirts and no show or anything, you know, winging it. <laughs> and, How did the audience react to you? Cause you, you were like different bands. Oh, very much. <laughs> I think, I think we were put together because there was some link with them, with the manage managers, but or the, uh, the agency, but it was the wrong thing. We could, it'd have been great if we could have gone over and played clubs and bars and, felt our way in but it was it was a bit scary we got away with it because that hit that, that was such a big hit everybody knew it and uh, so we just about got away with it so it's not about cheating obviously it's about a band member possibly playing with somebody else could, could, can you give me the reader's digest version um and well it wasn't the fact that he was playing with somebody else that was okay i mean we we were struggling but we we were a tight <laughs> band ace we, we we had a lot of fun and we were mad soccer fans we used to play soccer all the time so we had these our mates i might as well tell you who they are i think everybody knows now there's the band called sutherland brothers in quiver uh, who were doing a little better than us they had a record contract they were doing support tours and things like that and they were doing okay they borrowed a few a, a bass player tex coma because their bass player was ill or something which was okay but then while they while he was playing with them they were kind of ah you can you might get 25 quid a week here, mate, you know, do it. And uh, so I think he was sorely tempted, but uh, in the end, he, he didn't, he didn't take up the offer. He stuck with it. He stuck with us. How often I was talking to uh, Glenn. I, I used to say Chirac, Glenn Shurik, Randy Bachman, not Bachman. People screwed up your name through the years. Oh, well, that's happened forever since I was at school, you know. Really? Carrot, usually. Carrot, Paul Carrot. Garrick, Garrick, even actually the spelling's unusual because there's a few Carricks around. I think it's kind of 
Scottish or something like that. No, nah, it didn't bother me. Why did Ace break up? We didn't so much break up as fizzle out, you know. I mean, um, we had that one big old hit. Exciting as it was and as great as it was to be in the in America and touring and all that, it, we didn't handle it very well. It was a bit too much. It's a bit too much too soon, actually. It's a shame because... Uh, and I guess you could say there were some musical differences as well. I mean, I was the last one in to the band, but gradually I kind of almost took over a little bit the writing and the singing. And I bear in mind, I'd been penniless since leaving school. And I was, I, I thought this is a fantastic opportunity, but we're not good enough. We should get our act together. You know, you know, we should work at this and it could be really great. But the other guy, well, one or two of the other guys in particular were, you know, bit, they didn't think that was a good thing. That that was honest. They that they wanted to, um, I don't know, play more kind of blues kind of stuff or improvise a whole lot. You know, that those sort of things. But so hmm. it, it it anyway. By and large, we had the one hit and we never followed it up. So um, we gradually went downhill. Gradually downhill. Yeah. On one of his previous solo projects, he was uh, he was considering using me on that. Um, he ended up using a guy called Noel McCalla, who's a great singer. Um, but I'd only met him that once. But um, You were going to be on Small Creeps Day? Is that what it was called? It's, you know, Small Creeps Day is one of my... I have three favorite albums of all time. I have Toto the Seventh One, Small Creeps Day by Mike Rutherford, and Elton John's Mad Men Across the Water are my three favorite albums. <laughs> wow. You were going well, to be on Small Creeps Day? Possibly, if that's what it was. I mean, I don't know how many albums he made, to be honest. Well, that was his first one, 1980, I think it was. Yeah. That probably sounds about right. Oh, no, I, I've interviewed Noel I, I, because yeah. uh, I thought he did a great job. But, but man, you would have been awesome on that album. Well, I don't know. I mean, as I say, Noel is a great singer. So uh, Two first Mike and the Mechanic albums, I kept going... Because you're a writer, you know how to write a good song. So were you just brought in with Mike Rutherford? Just basically said, oh, "I need a vocalist." How did that? Did you know him before? No, I was drafted in as a singer. Again, there's a long story there. During the sort of mid '80s or early '80s, I I had a band together with Nick Lowe. Yes. Do you know Nick Lowe at all? Yeah, yeah. Um, after leaving Squeeze, that was one of the reasons I kind of left Squeeze was to work with Nick. We were hopelessly, we were just not what was happening in in music at that time. So we, we were low tech playing this strange rock and roll music, kind of skiffle rock and roll. And um, meanwhile, this things were changing, you know, the synthesizers and all, all that sort of stuff, which Nick wouldn't have anything to do with. He wouldn't have a synthesizer anywhere near the studio. But um, anyway, we had a lot of fun as as that band, but we we couldn't get arrested really, Tim, commercially or on the radio or anything like that. So um, that kind of fizzled out. We did a lot of tours opening up for people like Tom Petty, the Cars, uh, on these arena tours. You know, we'd go on at eight o'clock, the crowd would be disinterested, and by eight forty-five, we'd be in the bar. You know, so it was yeah. like that. Anyway, so that was just running its course and. We were, we were about to let it go. And I got a call from a guy called B.A. B. A. Robertson. Uh, and he asked me to sing a demo for him. I didn't know him, never met him. He said, I've written this song. I want to pitch it for a song, uh, for a movie. And we want that guy who sang How Long. So that's why I'm calling this. Oh, okay, I'll come down and sing it for you. You know, which I did. I didn't get paid for any of this, by the way. But, um, and, and he said, oh, oh, by the way, I'm writing songs with Mike Rutherford, you know, from Genesis and... Uh, He's not going to sing on this album. Would you be interested in coming down? So I said, yeah, sure. And I, that, that was my introduction to uh, Mike and the Mechanics. They, they'd recorded a whole lot of kind of tracks, you know, backing tracks, and they just needed some vocals on. And on that first album, there were several people doing the vocals, specifically uh, the guy, because eventually we became a touring outfit and we had the two lead singers, myself and a guy called Paul Young from Manchester, not not Paul Young from London. They kind of used to play us off against each other a little bit. In, I mean, not intentionally, I don't think. But, you know, we, we were both insecure singers. We had this nice gig in this new band that was 
happening. And um, but we we often kind of audition the same song, and then Mike would choose who got to sing it. You know, it's a bit like that. We were very different characters. Yeah, Paul was fantastic. He, he came alive when he was on stage. He loved being the front man. He was. He had charisma and he had, a, apart from a great voice, and he's a fun, gregarious kind of guy. I was more the sort of quiet, I don't know, soulful or whatever wow. guy. So we were very different characters, but we were both working class northern guys who knew how to be in a band. I always felt that I wanted to sing The Living Years. Well, yeah, considering your past, I, I, never, I never made the connection until... Yeah when I first reached out to you and I started doing more research and I went, wow, he sang living years and considering the story with your dad and Mike's dad. And mm. when did Mike lose his dad? Was it, was he around that time? Right? Because they, they both lost their fathers, both Mike and BA Robertson, both lost their fathers and had sons shortly afterwards. So uh, it, it happened around that time. Yeah. Well, you, did you think you must've thought of your dad when you were singing that song, you must get asked that. Well, absolutely. But you know, by the same token, it's not really like my relationship with my dad. That one is about unresolved stuff, and I should have said this, and I wish I'd told him that. I mean, there's a bit of that, but in in my case, it was more like I knew what it, the loss was about, you know, what that's like. And when I sing that line, it, it, you know, on stage, it, I wasn't there that morning when my father passed away. Yeah. I can vi I can see it as plain as day because I wasn't there. I wasn't allowed to be. I was, he was in hospital, you know, yeah. just like that. With Silent Running, that's another w one of those songs. I don't know why I, I when I looked it up, I remember going, that's just one of those songs that, has, that stayed with me for, what was your impression of that when you first? Uh, <laughs> well, that's, that's the first thing I did when BA took me down to the studio where they'd been working and they, they had this track, you know, a very simple track, three chords, for about seven minutes and the only thing they had was um can you hear me can you hear me running they said here yeah, ju just go in and uh, as mike had this phrase he used to say just just go in and blues away blues away you know so i went in there and did a can you hear me can you hear me running and and then bluesed away for a while with nothing no i didn't have a lyric or anything and um they said, oh, that sounds great. That sounds great. And so B.A. went off and he wrote this weird lyric, which is like Armageddon or something, because I don't know which came first, because it, it finished up in a movie on Dangerous Ground, it's called. I think it's a science fiction movie or something, um, a apocalyptic movie. So when I saw the lyric, I thought, oh, I'm going to make this work. I'm used to, come, baby, I love you, you know. And they said, take the children and yourself, hide out in the cellar. Oh, my God. But anyway, we made it work. What was the decision process of not being in Mike and the Mechanics? Was that your idea? Yeah. To be honest, when Paul passed away, I think, really, I think that would have been the time for us to have said, okay, you know, that's the end of that chapter. Because we we had a thing. It was it was a popular band, you know, and, and um, touring, and especially around UK and and, and Europe. And, and it became a thing that, that it was the three of us. It was Mike, Paul, and myself. When when he went, you know, it lost it lost the chemistry, to be honest. And um, probably should have left it there, to be honest with you. But um, we tried to keep. Mike wanted to keep keep it going. He felt that you know we had established something and we should try to keep it going so we did and um, then there was always a question of um, time because it would take time to write stuff record it promote tour whatever have you and it was taking up a, a quite a lot of time I felt that I wasn't giving myself enough time to do my thing which as I say I, I love being a part of all, other people's projects and um, but my game of wasn't really my thing in that sense. I mean, I think I brought something to it, but, you know, not necessarily. Um, I'm more of a rootsy fan, you know, um, soul, country, that sort of stuff. And I wanted to give myself the opportunity to, to <coughs> do that. And, and to be honest, not least because I actually realized that, you know, I'd, 
been doing this for a long time. I've sung hits for bands that made, and I, you know, and I think to be honest, the, the thing what did it was I put out a little compilation album of my own little label. And it, you know, it's called uh, the story so far. And I had to license records that I'd sung on, you know, to, to have on this thing. And I wasn't allowed to have the living years. <laughs> and I, and suddenly the penny dropped. It was like, you know, I have no rights to these songs, you know, and when it, which is okay. Oh, okay. I'll pay the license fee. But when it, when I was denied the opportunity to, when other third parties had used this song, you know, so and I, I can't really have a compilation without that. And, and that kind of made me think, you know what, even at this stage, which is 20 years ago, I need to have my own catalog of work that I own and control. So uh, that's kind of why I did it. And um, I left. And um, so there's a new kind of lineup now, and I'm, I'm sure they're very good. I mean, I know Andy Rochford is a great, great singer. So um, but that's fine. We're okay. I've seen Mike recently and we're fine. So. Have, you, uh, have you heard their newer stuff? Not really. By the way, when you left home, when when you were told, Mom, I'm taking my pots and pans, I'm leaving, it's time to leave home. What was, I'm curious, what was in your record collection by the time you were a man leaving home, getting out of the door? What were you listening well, not, to? Not much. There wasn't so much around. And, and records were expensive. I didn't have it, even have a, my own hi-fi, really, till uh, I was probably in my 20s. We'd, I didn't have a lot, but I can remember a stage in the sort of, um, yeah, early 70s. I had Talking Book, which was a massive record for me. I had an album by, uh, oh, Van, Van Morrison, Moondance. So I maybe I only had three or four albums, but I knew them inside out. I knew, I know Moondance inside out, Talking yeah. Book, you know. Yeah. The Elton John, uh, uh, Candle in the Wind, 97. You were on there? Uh, not Candle in the Wind. They they released a CD with Candle in the Wind and another song called Something in, Your, in the Way You Look Tonight. I'm right. playing on that one. Right. So a few people, you know, in, <laughs> hoping to make me sound a little more interesting, say he played on the biggest selling record of all time, which was Candle in the Wind. And Something in the Way You Look Tonight <laughs> which was also on that CD. But uh, nevertheless, it was great to play on an Elton John track. Yeah, what was what was it like working with El Elton John? I, I I just talked to Bill Champlin, and Bill said he was surprised when he came in to work with Elton. He says I expected a huge ego, and it was going to be this and that. And he says I know, I, I, but he says it was really low key, and he was really respectful. But how was it? What was it like for you? Yeah, I was pretty starstruck, you know, and insecure. I mean, I used to do a lot of well, not a lot, but I would do session work in the. Um, after a split up, because I saw that as a way of learning how to play, that all the guys that I knew in London who were who were good players, that's what they did. They did sessions, you know. Yeah. So, but I was really um, bluffing my way through a lot of these sessions because, you know, as I said, self-taught, don't really know what I'm doing. So I would turn up to sessions like that a little bit scared. So the Eagles got back together. So Timothy and Don. And you, uh, what, what else, what was involved in that project? You guys were going to form a band? Yeah. I mean, this is before they got back together. I don't know what was going on. I had known uh, Timothy. I met him in 75 when we went over with Ace and we were number one with uh, How Long or whatever. And uh, he was in a band called Poco. But I hadn't kept in touch with him, really. Actually, having said that, I seem to remember him turning up when I did a show in uh, LA with and with, with um, Don Henley. They came to see us playing in some club somewhere, the band that I had with Nick. But anyway, I got a call from Don Felder and he said, look, uh, the Eagles aren't working. We want to work. Timothy, Joe Walsh and myself, we want to do something. Would you be interested in coming over? Just to point out that at some point, Joe had bailed out before I got there. <laughs> so um, it was Felder, uh, Timothy, 
And I went over and stayed at Felder's place. Actually, I stayed on his boat, which was moored up in Oxenard. I stayed there. And we just started writing a few songs, making some recordings in Don's uh, little studio there. We had another guy uh, called Max Carl. Do you know Max Carl? From 30, he was in a band called 38 Special. Oh, I know the band, yeah. Yeah, terrific guy. A really, really oh, funny he's with, guy. Uh, with Grand Funk, isn't he now? He might be. He was with somebody else. But uh, um, 38 Special he had a hit with. and um, Second Chance. Second Chance, correct. Yeah. He was a funny, funny guy. And we, we had a lot of fun. We were belly laughs, you know, um, trying to make these tapes. And we recorded uh, various songs. Everybody was getting excited and saying, oh, this could be good. In fact, somebody said, uh, this could be Genesis meets the Eagles. And some guys, some guys said, oh, what, you mean the genitals? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, one of the songs I took over was this song, Love Will Keep Us Alive. And it was written by uh, uh, Jim Capaldi, Peter Vale, and myself. And we, we took this song over, and I was singing it. Um, so we made a bunch of tapes. Everybody's getting excited. It's going to be quite good. Anyway, obviously, to cut a long story short, the Eagles did actually reform. But the good thing was that I got a call from uh, Timothy saying, you know, I need a song to sing on the new record. And uh, I'd like to, how about I, I do Love Will Keep Us Alive? It's fantastic. Great. Where are the tapes of all this stuff? Do, they, do you think Don has them? I'm sure he does. <laughs> I'd be surprised if he doesn't, but uh, no, that's that's a good point, actually. I wonder if it'll ever see the light of day. But I tell you, there's another great, uh, another little story, actually. Uh, this is a funny one, because um, when they did uh, Long Road Out of Eden, Timothy called up and said, you know, I've, I need a song for the album. I've done a couple, but they've not really, uh, nobody's too excited about them. Any chance, you know, have you got anything? So I said, no, no, I haven't, but I will, I will try. And I, I put the phone down and literally sang, uh, sorry, wrote this song called I Don't Want to Hear Anymore, uh, which I think is not a bad song, actually. I made the demo, sent it over, and I didn't hear anything. So I thought, oh, well, there you go. And then um, when Timothy was over the Eagles in the UK, um, he said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm still looking for a song. I said, oh, what about that one I sent you? He said, Send that, send that to me again. So I sent it to him again. Anyway, there must have been a year between me sending the original demo and them actually cutting it and it going on the album, which was great. I was a fantastic. It's such a feather in your cap, you know, it's such an accolade. When they do, it's, I mean, they don't do too many outside songs, you know. I kept telling everybody, got a song on the new Eagles album, you know. Everybody's, oh, well done, mate. It's great. It said, yeah, it's how long, isn't it? I said, no, 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 not How Long, no. It's a new song. I wrote, oh, well, their new single is called How Long. I said, oh, are you kidding? Oh. And, uh, and then I asked Timothy about it, and he said, yeah, that, that song, uh, is, it's a J.D. Salva song, I believe, and it was written, um, they'd recorded that, a version of that song, before the Ace version. What? And the ace, the ace version came out, and they thought, "Oh, we can't put, we can't put that out now." How different would things have been for me if that if they'd their version had come out first? You played with the Roger Waters at an interesting time in his career, considering Pink Floyd was out there doing their thing. And what was that experience like? Well, it it was great for for us. I mean, um, you know, we. It, it must have been very, very strange uh, for Rog because um, we were on tour with Rog, Roger doing an album called Radio Chaos the, exactly the same time as, as the Floyd were down the road. We were playing in the arena and they were playing in the football stadium and it, and it, and the, the split was happening then. So, you know, obviously it must have been a, a very tough time for Rog. What must have been going through his, his mind? But um, no, I... I'm I'm a big fan of Roger as, as a as a guy. He's, he's very funny, actually. A lot of people I don't think know that you know that uh, he's got a very dark sense of humor, but um, he's always been very good to me. When I found out that you were playing with Madness, that's the only time <laughs> where I went, 
that's the only time where I went, what? He's with Madness. Why is he with Madness? But how did that happen? Just simply, um, I mean, London back then was a small world, really. Everybody kind of knew everybody. Yeah. And um, I think it was they, the keyboard player, I think Ben Barson, he left or something was going on and he didn't fancy. And they had a few dates in America and um, they needed a keyboard player. Somebody must have said, oh, give Carrick a ring, you know, he's, he'll do it. So, uh, so I did. And that, <laughs> but that was a strange experience. I mean, the, the Nutty Boys, they were like a, a gang, you know, they were like a, a, a gang of London teenagers, really. They had, they had their own thing. And it was, <laughs> it was funny. It was entertaining. Uh, did you start with the guitar first or the piano? No, I started with drums a few bits and pieces in the attic that had belonged to my dad. And I used to bash along to records. My brother played guitar. So there was a guitar always hanging around. We didn't have a piano with no room. We played a little, as I explained before, we lived in a little room at the back of the shop. I would have loved to have had a piano. My uh, uncle had a piano and on a Sunday, sometimes we'd visit him and I'd be tinkering away. And then I remember one Sunday I turned up, and it was locked and, and they'd lost the key. So <laughs> I never got any further. I would have loved to learn, but no. So keyboards came last. There must be people on the bucket list that you'd like to play with. Let's just send that into the ether. Who would you like to play with? There's nobody on the bucket list because um, I'm quite happy. Played with a lot of different people. It's been fantastic. I love playing with Eric. Um, but I've got my own thing to do. So, uh, but I mean, there's so many artists, obviously, you know, I respect and, and love, but I'm not waiting for the phone to ring because I, I, you know, what time I got left, I'm, I'm spending on my, on myself and my own thing and trying to leave what I can. Are you more discerning now because of your age with decisions? Uh, probably. I mean, I've got one eye on the clock, but at the same time, I, for some reason, I think that I'm young. I've only just started that I haven't done anything yet you know I, when I look back yeah it's quite a lot but I keep thinking I haven't done it I could have done a lot more you know I could have done I can do something better I still keep thinking that but realistically yeah time's ticking by but you know we'll see I was listening to uh, the live uh, you know the live series that you've put that you put just put up um uh, what gave you that idea? Because I just I I love the different versions of the tunes you you did. It wasn't my it wasn't really my idea to be honest. I mean, I've got a good friend who I guess is my manager. Now. <laughs> I guess. Well, we don't have contracts and things like that. He's just he was the Pete Van Hook, who was the original drummer in Mike and the Mechanics. He played with uh, Van Morrison for yeah. ten years or so. So Pete is my mate. He's my biggest fan. He helps me keep this on the road, you know, and. Um, he, it was his idea. I, I don't listen to myself much, you know, certainly not live recordings, but um, he kept saying, ah, oh, it's good, man. I'd say, ah, oh, it's great, man. You know, so he, he put it together. He, and he promised me that he listened to all this stuff. I believe him, you know. <laughs> but Eric is that good, isn't he? Of course he is, yeah. yeah. He's, uh, he's the real thing. I've only played with him in recent years. You know, he's in the, twilight of his career obviously but he still loves to play but um he can only play the way he feels he may have been something else back in the day you know uh but what he is now is is real you know and he doesn't fake it so um for me it's an absolute honor to 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 play with him to be chosen He's got the pick of everybody. Any, anybody would want to play with Eric, you know. And um, it, I think he's I think he's great. And he's one of the few, well, he is the only Eric Clark. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of great guitarists. And he's the first to admit it and the first to respect it. But he, there's only one Eric. I mean, what song are you most proud of? Is there one that stands out? Um, no, I, I think I've written a few half-decent songs. I'm, I mean... I like that song that the Eagles did, um, Not Love Will Keep Us Alive. Um, I Don't Want to Hear Anymore. I think it's a good song. I'm writing, 
I'm not particularly um, crazy about my songwriting. I think as a singer, I can make a half decent song sound okay. <laughs> but my favorite song will always be How Long, because that's the first one. From my shoulder, uh, what was your co contribution to that song? Oh, it was, it was big. A very simple song. Um, I went down to Mike's house. He's played these chords. He got the drum machine thing, you know, and uh, the chords. And uh, he said, oh, I've got another bit as well in the middle. And um, and we did the blues away thing, you know, where he puts he put the cassette player on. Yeah. He's And I, I started to sing. And uh, I'm just free forming, singing, singing away, bluesing away. And then I'm thinking, now Mike's not going to like this. This is too uh, pop. This is too repetitive and too pop. He's not going to like this. Anyway, got to the end, 20 minutes or something. The tape runs out. And Mike says, uh, you know what? There was uh, something at the beginning you did. I think, okay. So you run it back to the beginning. And there I'm singing. Don't ask me why, but I'm singing. Looking back over my shoulder. Da -da -dee 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 -ba -da -da -ba -da -da -da. The whole shape. And, and some of the lyrics, you know, and what, that's a great start, you know, so fleshing it out is, is, is easy once you've got a, a title and a, a thing, a shape. Yeah. There you go. Hope you enjoyed our interview with the great Paul Carrick. Remember, pick up a t-shirt, links in the description of this video and links to our other chats with Paul as well. Make sure you comment on our video, subscribe to our channel and share our videos. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Book. Mm -hmm.